On Story is brought to you in part by the Alice Clayburgh Reynolds Foundation, a Texas family providing innovative funding since 1979. On Story, presented by Austin Film Festival. A look inside the creative process from today's leading writers and filmmakers. This week's On Story, Friends and Grace and Frankie creator, Marta Kaufman. Friends is about that time in your life when your friends are your family. Once you have a family of your own, everything changes. David Crane and I met at Brandeis at the time we were both actors. We met doing a play. I played a street whore and he played an urchin. And that's how we met. And we were both taking a class together and someone offered me to direct a production of Godspell. The irony of that production is the guy who played the Jesus part is now a rabbi. <laughs> um, and I said to David, would you be in it? And he said, no, but I'll direct it with you. And that was the beginning of our relationship. After that, we started writing together and realized, God, it's way more fun on this side of the table. Morning. You know, I've got a real good feeling about this, Philly. Well, first of all, we were HBO's first comedy. Um, Universal had all these hours and half hours of TV that they didn't know what to do with. It's a huge library. Um, and they had a million people come in and interview for the job of trying to turn it into a series. So when they scraped the bottom of the barrel and found these two musical theater writers, um, we talked about how we grew up on television and how much it influenced our lives. So that's where it started. And... <laughs> um, when we first pitched it, we found out after doing it, we had to do an enormous amount of research, watch a million of those things, and then we had a research, we'd research guys who we'd write, you know, the clip we're looking for is something like this. And he would, they would do the research, and we discovered at a certain point that if it was shot, I think it was um, after 1960, and they, the person was still alive, we couldn't use the clip. So we'd see these perfect clips and we'd go, oh, please be dead, please be dead. <laughs> um, and then we would get to use the clip. So how much did your musical theater background actually help you? Do you think, you, it, do you think it gave you an advantage? I, I think it's two things. One of them is because we, were, we wrote lyrics, we learned rhythm. And the rhythm of lines are very meaningful. They, you know, the... the we would argue about if it's a comma or an ellipsis because it changes the rhythm. We were thrown into Dream On, had never done TV. Um, so we, we were self-taught and we were very, very lucky that we were trusted enough to do this, you know, sort of guerrilla television out in the middle of nowhere. I remember David and I sitting around talking about what kind of series we wanted to do and we were in a group of six people in New York. Um, we were, you know, we were all we had. We were all there by ourselves. Um, four of the six turned out to be gay. Um, and we are actually all st still quite close after all these years. You know, these were, this was our group. And what we had talked about is, is that basically it's about that time in your life when your friends are your family, because once you have your own family, things change. He's not alone. <laughs> ugly naked guy is having Thanksgiving dinner with ugly naked gal. <laughs> oh. All right, ugly naked guy. <laughs> oh, ugly naked dancing. <laughs> it's nice that he has someone. I feel like the stars were aligned, everything was right, because that pilot wrote itself in three days. You know, we just sort of got out of the way. 
<laughs> and let it go. Um, and then the rest was just magic. So what was going on in the television world right around the time that you, because that, that started in 94, right? Yeah. So what was that world like for other shows that were in the same zone as you? And I'm sure the whole ramp up of whether your show was going to make it past the first season, et cetera. What, and to, you know, what, <clears throat> how were you prepping for the life of your show compared to the other? You don't. Um, Seinfeld was on, that was the closest comparison, but we've always said, they don't hug on Seinfeld. <laughs> um, we wanted our show to have warmth. We wanted these to be people that you wished you were friends with, you know, that you wanted to hang with and have a beer or a lasagna. Um, <laughs> it, uh, we weren't at the time like anything else on TV. And I recall that after, after the first, I think, three episodes, we jumped into the top 10. And then within a season, we were in the top five. So it was a pretty quick, um, it was a pretty quick success with the audience. Um, after we did that first season, suddenly, everybody's trying to do shows about groups of young people. And I kept saying, I, it makes no sense because TV is not a formula. You have to be lucky and hit the right feeling at the right time. After 9-11, one of the things that we saw happen is that people flocked to friends because it was comfort. And I like the idea that we do comfort TV, that it's, you know, there are plenty of beautiful shows. Comfort is not what they offer. Um, if anything, they make you uncomfortable, and that's part of what they're trying to do, and that's great, but that's not what I do. And that's not, you know, what we wanted to do. We wanted to do something where we wanted to hang out with us. And the other thing we kept saying to ourselves, we want to do something that we would watch. I think, except for Joey, each of the characters, each of the women has a piece of me or David. I mean, Dave, not the women. He's got a lot of both Chandler and, and Ross in him. Um, yes, I'm the person who wants to close the marker until it clicks. You know, I have that, that you know, controlly thing. It's bossy thing. It's terrible. Um, but I also have the little bit of the Phoebe spirity thing. Um, and I was raised probably to be like Rachel. Um, I hope I'm not that, but... Um, and basically it came from us sitting around, and we weren't even talking about us, but you're always part of the character because you're writing it, but we were talking about David's cousin and you know people we knew, and they just sort of slowly, as we talked about them, the ones that made us laugh, the ones that felt like we could wrap our minds around those characters. Like I understood Monica, the mother hen. I got that. I got the woman who's at the center of it. But she was a little different when we started. She was a little, a little tougher. Um, so it's it's really you. You're inspired by people you know. You're inspired by things about yourself that you either think are funny or neurotic or just you know. I'd love to see someone else do that instead of me. Um, and then the actor brings new breath to it. You know. Surely you have a thought of where your show is ultimately going to go before you started it, or maybe not. Nope. <laughs> no, and fortunately, Friends is not lost, where you would hope that they there was a place that you're landing. Um, we didn't have to do all those twists and turns. You create characters, um, you put them in a situation, you create relationships, and then you see what happens. And you don't know. You don't know until an actor comes and breathes life into the character who's got chemistry. You don't know. We didn't know that Matt LeBlanc was really funny playing dumb. We had no idea that Joey was dumb. Um, and he was really good at it and really, really funny at it. Um, so, you know, that changes things as you go on. Story-wise, all we really had a sense of was that season. And at that point, we only had, I think originally it was... Um, 
I think 13 episodes, the first order. And it wasn't until we were like at episode 10 that they said, all right, you have more episodes. So you can't really plan for the end of the season because you don't know where they're going to tell you. Our writer's room started smaller and got bigger as the years went on because primarily because the schedule for the writer in multi-camera is brutal. It's brutal. Um, you know, you have to keep moving forward with new stories and new outlines and all of that stuff. And the week itself, um, table read on Monday, do rewrite after that. That generally wasn't too late of a night unless none of the stories worked and then you wanted to throw yourself out a window. Um, you would have a run through on Tuesday just for us. And usually that was around three or four o'clock. Then we would give notes, come back to the writer's room, and that's when the rewrite started. On Wednesday, we would do based on that, and the, they had to have the script by nine o'clock the next morning. Wednesday, it's another run through, and this time for the network in the studio, another set of notes, another rewrite. Um, Thursdays, we would do camera blocking, and that was another bunch of rewrites. So the schedule was completely brutal. So as time wore on, um, we had to add more people because we just couldn't do it. By the last, I think, two seasons, we finally figured out that we should have an early room and a late room, um, and that you know a late room will follow one episode, and then you switch it, and you know you have rooms sort of so not everybody is there until three o'clock in the morning every night. So when Friends became sort of zeitgeist, was there a pressure in the writers' room to to? keep that going? I mean, when it became, I mean, you, and even now you can't, I was reading the New York Times the other day about something totally unrelated to entertainment. And they, the article referred to a Friends episode. And, <laughs> and I mean, that, and that's not still uncommon. I mean, people still keep talking about it and yet you've been off the air over 10 years. So, so was there pressure to, to maintain that? Did you guys even feel that or was it just something that happened? You know, <laughs> We didn't experience that because we were working. Um, we had to come in every day. We had to come up with 24 episodes. We had to shoot 24 episodes. Then we had to read hundreds of writers for the following season. So we didn't think about that ever. Um, it was always surprising to us when we, you know, I can remember walking through the airport and every cover was one of them. And I was like, what? Whose show is that? Because I don't experience it. Um, David tells a story. He was walking in Central Park with his friend's jacket on. And he said he's walking. It was like around dusk, and there are two guys following him. And he's getting really nervous. And David's a wuss. <laughs> and he's sort of, sort of walking faster and faster and faster, and the guys are walking faster and faster and faster, and then they finally reach him, and he think, he's thinking, they're going to kill me, they're going to kill me. And one of them says, where'd you get the jacket? <laughs> <laughs> those are those moments where you go, oh, it's out there. <laughs> There's such great visual gags in there. Like, How did you talk about some of those moments? Well, let's talk about Joey with the turkey on his head. <laughs> That's quite a visual. <gasps> oh, my God! I know. It's stuck! It's, Steph, how did it get on? Well, I put it on to scare Chandler. There were things like, in the prom video episode, at the very end of that episode, when... Rachel, she crosses the entire apartment and goes over to Ross and kisses him. We knew people were invested in that relationship, but we had no idea how invested they were. And it got a, such an uproar from the audience. Um, that, was, that was surprising and thrilling. Even more surprising was when we discover Monica and Chandler in bed. We thought it was just going to be a really funny, uncomfortable thing for the two of them, and it would be really awkward, and what it would do to the six of them. We had to stop 
because people were screaming so much in London. Screaming. Morning, Ross. I'm getting married today! Yeah, you are! Oh, woohoo! <laughs> you think you knew I was here? That was surprising. Um, I think it always felt so good when things were emotional and funny at the same time. You know, people talk about we were on a break. That was a really, I mean, that <laughs> happens to people. Um, I guess there were, there were things like, <laughs> I love the birth episodes myself. I used to get so emotional every time I saw Phoebe with the triplets and she's talking to them and telling them that she's gonna, you know, that killed me. I also, one of my favorite things in the world, and I don't know why, I loved Ross and Susan in the closet when Carol is giving birth. Because I think they have a really interesting argument um, where he basically says, every day is lesbian mother day. You get to be the baby's father. Oh. Everyone knows who you are. And who am I? There's, there's Father's Day, there's Mother's Day. There's no lesbian lover day. Every day is lesbian lover day. <laughs> you know, this is dealing with real hurt that he was feeling and it was funny and it was emotional. And that's my favorite stuff to write when it's funny and it's emotional. We watched the first and last episode last night and I was really surprised how I got a little, you know, verklempt. <laughs> I did. Um, so there were all those moments over the years that just, I, I love, those are my favorite moments, the ones that surprised me. Um, the ones that were more moving than we expected them to be. That was, there is, when, when Joey moves out for that brief period of time, and he and Chandler, you know, Joey's looking, it looks like he's looking through a, with rain, and it's just that little sculpture, and Chandler's playing ping pong with himself, and um, as funny as it was, it was actually really sweet because you knew this was coming from a place of how much they love each other. You know, this sort of homoerotic bro thing. <laughs> David Crane and I used to say that I, if we were a person, um, I was the organs and he was the hair and the fingernails and the eyes and the details. That's what we used to say about ourselves. But we went, we wanted to do different things. And it was interesting to me because I sort of looked at episodes and I looked at my show and I, for the first time, began to understand the difference between us. David is hilariously funny. He is probably the funniest person I know. And then I started to realize how much I liked the heart. I enjoy making people cry as much as I enjoy making people laugh. He always did the typing. And I always, you know, we were talking, but he did all the typing. And when I first started writing on my own, uh, there was no one to talk to. So I would talk to myself. You know, what do you think of this idea? Yeah, I don't know. Um, and then began to develop a way to just have that go on in there and not be on the page. Um, and, and it became a completely different process that I had to learn how to manage. And I started to really get a sense of, oh, this is my process. It's not the same as when I was with another person. I learned that I have what I call a vomit draft. Just, you know, get away from the blank page, get whatever words on paper, and then the writing starts. And I also learned I write in waves. And... Everybody has their own way of doing this, but I write in waves, and I'll sort of ride a wave, and then it's over, and then I'm like, Ugh, all right, I gotta go do something, and I'll be going to do something else, and then I'll get the next idea for the next scene, and I go back, and I write, ride that wave. And I just had to accept that's my process. That's how I do it. The project came about, there was a woman I had um, taken a trip with who I'd met on this trip, and she was lovely. And we said, we should work together sometime. We had lunch, and she said to me, 
that Lily Tomlin and Jane Fonda want to do TV. I thought she meant together. So I called that same agent and I said, I hear Lily Tomlin and Jane Fonda want to do a TV show together. And she said, I don't know, I'll call you right back. <laughs> 20 minutes later, she called me back and she said, they do now. <laughs> so now we had to come up with something. And um, I should just say, I'm gonna take a little pause for a second. Um, my producing partner, Robbie Tolan, and Hannah Cantor are part of the spine of this show. Hannah and I were sitting in the car trying to come up with ideas, and I had had an idea, and this is before Transparent was on the air, that um, Jane's character would be married to a man and they get divorced and she comes back as Lily. Um, but Transparent was happening, and Hannah came up with the idea that their husbands, that they're not, they don't like each other, their husbands fall in love and get married. So that was her idea. You're leaving me? Yes. Who is she? Oh, it's not what you think. It's a he. Excuse me? And it's Saul. I'm in love with Saul. Saul and I are in love. After that, we started working with Jane and Lily and, you know, sort of pitching it to them and getting their input. And um, once we had a formed idea, um, we pitched it everywhere. We always knew we did not want to be on network TV. We did not want to have to do that. Our, we either wanted to be on pay cable or Netflix. And we got very lucky to get more than one offer, but we also felt strongly that Netflix was the place. And here's why. Um, and this is both a blessing and a curse. After you write the first episode, they don't call it a pilot. They call it a first episode. Um, if they like the script, you go straight to 13 episodes. You go right into production. You don't have to do a pilot, shoot the pilot, and wait two years till HBO can make a decision. And truthfully, considering the ages of our actors, we didn't have two years to wait. Um, so Netflix wanted it, and they were our number one choice, and it has been... Um, the, the idea of going straight to 13 is fascinating because it was so exciting. We're going to, yay. But you don't have a pilot to make mistakes. You don't, the learning curve happens while you're in production, which I have to say is it's like being on the scariest roller coaster in the whole world. I mean, my hair was like this by the end. Um, it was very, very frightening and because you just don't know. We sort of hit our stride, I think, after the fourth or fifth episode, started to get a sense of where the line between comedy and drama is. And part of that was, again, being um, their first self-produced comedy. Um, they kept saying, more drama, more drama, more drama. And then they, at one point, went, you know what? You can make it funnier. We were like, oh, thank you. Um, we, I mean, we always meant for it to be real and deal with real things. I mean, you don't get to talk about dry vaginas in other areas except <laughs> Grace and Frankie. That's where you can talk about it. Um, and there are so many people going through so we kept thinking there's this great audience for it. The big surprise has been that the audience has a much wider age, age range than they ever expected, than we ever expected. My hope is that it's like Friends, you know, that it's um, universal stories. Even if we're talking about dry vaginas, it's universal stories. It's about starting your life over. Who doesn't want to think about starting their lives over if you're in a bad place? I also think, and we've talked about this, um, the... There was a review that called it, and I don't read reviews, so Hannah reads them to me if I'm scared. Um, there was one review that called it comfort food, sort of not unlike the way people feel watching Friends, that it's comfortable, it's easy, it's not going to ask you to um, have insomnia afterwards because you're feeling yucky about people. Um, it's a much warm, again, it's warmer, and it's, and... I think that's partly why. Part of it is absolutely Jane Fonda, Lily Tomlin, and uh, uh, Martin and Sam and June and Brooklyn, I believe, brought a younger audience, and I, they just stuck with it. I mean, I was shocked that 
people in their 20s were watching it and enjoying it. And, and I think especially for women, they're going, I will be there one day. You've been watching A Conversation with Marta Kaufman on On Story. On Story is part of a growing number of programs in Austin Film Festival's On Story project, including the On Story PBS series, now streaming online, the On Story radio program and podcast in collaboration with Public Radio International, and the On Story book series available on Amazon. To find out more about On Story and Austin Film Festival, visit onstory.tv or austinfilmfestival.com.